Nazamil, we invited um, the Indian High Commission to come along. Sadly, uh, they w were still waiting for a response, obviously, uh, a boat that they've missed. But uh, India does have a case, doesn't it? It has this document that was signed. I think um, I'm going to quote Victoria's book and say that um, no one has ever seen the original document. Um, India refused to show the original document and there are some discrepancies. There are many other scholars and authors, including Bhutturi, who have mentioned that uh, the timings are off. That the what are Indian you suggesting, that this document was never signed and that it's a figment of someone's imagination? I think, I think that is a possibility. The second option is that it was signed, but it was signed after the invasion. The invasion had already occurred and then the uh, instrument of accession was signed. So in that sense, it's an illegal occupation. But I think someone who's more qualified and better learned than I am is uh, Victoria to answer that question from her. Well, um, Victoria, please elaborate it's, on, on I this. I think the, 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 it's a very contentious issue. And um, one of the difficulties, as, as Muzumil has pointed out, and as my research has shown, is that there are discrepancies in terms of when the Maharaja actually signed the document. But the bigger picture is that the document was signed under certain conditions, if it, indeed, as I say, it, it was most probably signed after the arrival of Indian troops. But there were certain preconditions. Uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir only acceded to India and gave up authority in relation to foreign affairs, communications, uh, currency. And um, the point was, and it was actually the uh, Viceroy Governor General, Lord Mountbatten, who suggested the um, ex instrument of accession should be signed, on condition there was a, a referendum or plebiscite to confirm and one can't have the signing of the instrument of accession without the other half, so to speak, of the arrangement. And this is where the whole issue arises, this feeling of pent-up frustration from the Kashmiris that they've never actually been able to endorse what the ruler signed up to or agreed to. Think, and this is where you get the difficulty. I think there is a, another uh, aspect to this as well, the fact that uh, the instrument of accession is a failed document anyway, considering that Muslim-majority states after the partition were meant to go to Pakistan and Muslim, uh, and sorry, Hindu-majority states to India. So naturally, Kashmir was meant to go to Pakistan. The reality, the current reality the situation is slightly different, but then it was meant to go to Pakistan. If they say there was an instrument of accession signed, then let them go back to the history of uh, Junagadh. I think in Junagadh it was also a Hindu population, majority population, but a Muslim ruler and the Indian and Hyderabad. state. Hyderabad. Is and, and Hyderabad the, as well. The obvious comparison. Well, Rathor, if it's all it's as clear-cut as that, um, why is uh, the United Nations still appearing to sit on the fence and uh, why will India not acknowledge uh, the other side of the argument? Well, I will come back to uh, the point you raised earlier on. That uh, you see, the the division of uh, the India was uh, like this: that either any state, either either uh, it can go to Pakistan or can go to India, or if if they want to become independent, so they can become independent as well. Well, so, unfortunately, Vatur, that was not part of the partition yeah. plan. The Br well, British government was very concerned about what it called Balkanization of India, and so I, and I think. We've also got to put in perspective that the movement, in a way, has moved on, and we have got this voice of, of the Kashmiri people, and in a way, it doesn't do us too much good to sort of pick over partition as such, because you've certainly got areas of, for example, Pakistani-administered Kashmir, the Gilgit-Baltistan region, yeah. which is definitely, really, it's where it wants to be, equally Ladakh. Um, is where it wants to be. Yeah. So in a way we've got a difficult issue now because we can't go back to the drawing board, so to speak, because the issue itself has moved on. Well, before Mumtaz yeah. Rathor comes yeah. back onto that, I want uh, you to uh, listen to another perspective, this time from a Pakistani politician, Mohammed Ajaz al-Haq, the son of the late General Zia, talking to Agenda's Mohammed Walji. With the situation in Kashmir, why is India looking at it as an internal issue? See, the problem uh, uh, with the situation has been that uh, this has been a disputed uh, territory all along. Uh, right from the beginning in 1948, it was India which went to the United Nations. And uh, they uh, agreed to a plebiscite, uh, which never happened because by, by force they took, uh, took over uh, and occupied the 
the area. Now they claim it is our area. We don't claim. We also claim that Pakistan also claims that it is our area. But then again, there has to be a solution which has to be found uh, uh, within the three parties, basically Pakistan, India, uh, and the people of Kashmir. So it is the people of Kashmir who are going to decide what they want. If we look at the claim of Pakistan that Kashmir should be a part of them based on the fact that they're a majority Muslim, and we compare it with the notion by India based on the 1947 instrument of assertion signed by the Maharaja, how can we dispute that claim? See, uh, it, it is very clear. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It was agreed uh, on uh, the Muslim majority areas will go with Pakistan. It was agreed that Kashmir will go with Pakistan. It was only Maharaja Hari Singh who uh, sort of uh, uh, at that time <coughs> did not agree. And then you know that in 1948 there was a war between India and Pakistan. We occupied a, a certain area and they retained certain area because uh, the, the British at that time were uh, uh, supporting India and not Pakistan, who, who had left, who had ruled uh, the, the uh, subcontinent for, for, for a long time. And uh, uh, the claim, the, the thing was, it was decided that it will be the people of, uh, and it was Nehru who wrote the letter to the United Nations, uh, that uh, we want to have a plebiscite over there, let the people decide if they want to uh, go with Pakistan. At that time, there was no uh, talk of independent Kashmir. It's clear that the Kashmiris want independence for themselves. But is there anyone else that actually believes that Kashmiri should be independent? Well, of course, uh, Pakistan is uh, a party to it. India is a party to it. Uh, I think the international community should be a party to it. There are resolutions of the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, going back 60 years. Uh, they should be implemented, like they have been implemented in some other places. Uh, so uh, there is a group. I mean, uh, independent surveys uh, keeping uh, apart. Uh, but I think there is uh, still a majority, uh, more than 50 percent, who uh, would like to um, have uh, a Kashmir which is uh, affiliated with Pakistan in one way or another. This is their sentiments. Mumtaz Rathor, did you agree with that? Or? No, I don't agree with this one. I mean, I mean, if you go to Kashmir, uh, I'm talking about the Indian uh, occupied Kashmir, and if you ask people there, uh, what they want and I think majority of the people I could say that 95% of the people they want to have a a right of self-determination they want to choose their destiny which has not been given to them from the last 60 years and I don't think so that Ajasa what he said that 50% of the people they want to join with Pakistan no this is not the case now it might be this is this was the case maybe 25 30 years ago but I don't think this is the case now would you agree with that, uh, Victoria? I understand that uh, you met uh, retired General Pervez Musharraf lately and, and the, the, the issue of Kashmir cropped up. Well, I think, I mean, actually, um, what Ijaz al-Haq said was that, Kesh, that, that uh, I mean, he sort of slightly slid over it. He said that um, Pakistan supported an independent Kashmir. Pakistan has never supported an independent Kashmir, and this is where you've got a difficulty with the rhetoric. Uh, on the one hand, Pakistan has supported the right of Kashmiri's uh, self-determination, but they've never accepted, and this has been right through any government, the Kashmir, the th what's called traditionally the third option, that of independence. And at the time of the insurgency in the late 1980s, early 1990s, this issue came up all along, because this is when we referred back again to the plebiscite, back again to the UN resolutions. In that case, the question was asked, uh, Will Kashmiris have their, their plebiscite? Will they have the right to decide, as was agreed in 1948, um, to decide whether they join India or Pakistan? But then the Kashmiri movement, by this stage, the independent movement, the foundation of the JKLF, the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, had put forward, well, actually, if there's to be a change, what we really would like to do is put put our sort of hat in the ring for, for independence. Pakistan never agreed to that and you had this anomalous rhetoric whereby they were on the one hand supporting the right of self-determination but saying no, no, they've got to decide whether they want to join Pakistan. The second complication which we must look at if we're talking about the state is that there are different opinions within the state. You mentioned to Rathor about the, different, uh, the fact that there's not one charismatic leader, but you've got different groupings who have different aspirations. 
and you do have a group of Buddhist Ladakhis, you do have a group of Hindus living in Jammu, and you do have predominantly Muslims, literally um, living in Gilgit Baltistan, which is part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. You then have what the Pakistanis call Azad Free Jammu and Kashmir, uh, what is traditionally called Pakistani administered Kashmir. They all have a, a right to have a say, but they all have a different say. And without this being a communal issue, which it certainly should not be, you can't um, have a tyranny of the majority either. So if you are going to really resolve the Kashmir issue, you've got to have such as we've got a round table and everybody's got to have their say in terms of what they'd like to be as their future. This is why you asked me earlier about the difficulty with the international community is that it's very complicated and you've got to sit and study it. Certainly as you mentioned Pervez Musharraf he did try and alter, he sort of looked at what was going on and he tried to alter uh, what might be possible by not attaching such importance as previous Pakistani rulers had to the holding of the plebiscite, because he also saw that for example if by an extraordinary quirk of fate the uh, majority, and it would only have to be a 50.05% majority voted to stay with India, that would mean Pakistan would lose the whole of Gilgit, Baltistan and the areas <coughs> they controlled. What I really feel that people don't look at is that the plebiscite was only agreed to because both sides thought they'd win it. And you can't actually have a method of adjudication that you're not prepared to lose. Would you uh, agree with those points, Ms. Amil? I think yes. Um, uh, the, issue, the issue isn't so much that should Kashmir go to Pakistan, should it go to India, should it, go to, uh, should it be self-sufficient and rule itself. I think the fundamental problem right now is that people are demanding freedom, but they're demanding freedom on different levels. The, w number one is the freedom to choose the way they live their lives. Number two is the economic freedom, the social freedom, the political freedom, to exercise the basic fundamental human rights that every citizen of this world is allowed to do. Be they the citizens of America, of South Africa, of Germany, of the UK, we are living in a global village. We are the citizens of the world and we should be given the same rights as everyone else. And I think this is the fundamental crux of the problem. It sounds like a tug of love with the child wanting neither parent. And we are not a divorced child. <laughs> and ultimately we are not a divorced child. We the are, child's grown up. Exactly. Yes. The child has grown up 63 years old. Well, we're heading towards a break now and as usual there's a question. I want to know who said this. Resolution of the dispute over Kashmir would help deny extremists in the region one of their main calls to arms and allow Pakistani authorities to focus more effectively on tackling the threat on their western borders. Stay tuned for the answer right after the news.